fringe debate on the necessary and sufficient conditions of gender has seeped into the mainstream news cycle, fomenting a debate with a surface temperature loosely akin to the sun's molten core. Fueled by the white-hot heat of interpersonal hatred, the gender debate has sparked all sorts of outrage, from Jordan Peterson's opposition to the law C-19, the persecution of Kathleen Stock for her biological view of sex and gender, to whatever happened with that bloke in the can of Bud Light. As a result, each participant in the wider debate has attempted to lay claim to what the concept of gender refers to and who has the authority to define it. This work is by no means exhaustive. Instead, I will engage with one of many perspectives on gender and take it to its logical conclusion. There are no genders and there is nothing into which the concept of gender refers to leading ultimately to the abolition of gender. Gender theory emerged in the 1970s among the intellectual milieu that gender roles were produced and prescribed by the institutions of society. As the anthropologist Gail Rubin notes in The Traffic in Women, gender is a socially imposed division of the sexes, a division that is imposed on the sexes beginning during primary socialization in the family unit. According to Rubin, the demarcation between the genders is imposed during the gift exchange of women as fathers give away their daughters to their future husbands, a process conferring power and prestige to the bride's new family. Born from this exchange is the division of labour and most saliently childcare. Rubin, drawing on Freudian psychoanalysis, states that the mother, assuming the main caregiving role, is psychologically imperative. The development of heterosexual masculinity and femininity depends on both the son and daughter viewing their mother as an object of sexual desire and ultimately endeavouring to find a partner, a partner like their mother, or for daughters, unable to have their own penis, to find a partner and have children in order to satisfy their penis envy. According to Rubin, what we ought to do is to subvert the socially prescribed roles of the sex gender system and to define such terms individually. Similarly, Judith Butler, an American philosopher and gender studies writer, proposes her own view of gender called performativity, stating that our gender is always being defined from the moment we come into the world and medical professionals assign our gender at birth to the way that others interpret such labels based on the social norms and gender roles of the time throughout the course of our life. But most saliently, we as individuals are always defining our gender for our own behaviour, dressing modestly, caring for children and indulging in a life of domesticity was, in our recent history, women performing their gender. What was repeated and routinized became real. However, for Butler, gender is simply whatever gender does. And women today are free to behave and ultimately to define womanhood for their own free repeated behaviours and these routinized behaviours may come to shape gender norms or even extinguish norms we were once accustomed to. The key to displacing patriarchal gender norms is to perform our gender roles with greater variety, to chart new expanses of human expression and to break free from the moulds, to shatter the status quo. For Butler, this may take the form of drag queens who, through their caricatures of womanhood, highlight the absurdity of such gender roles or the use of non-binary pronouns and language. Broadening the definition of gender until it refers to no necessary particulars. However, if gender refers to no thing in particular and has no shared intersubjective meaning, then what do such reference refer to? In bodies that matter, Butler clarifies that performativity is both bodily and linguistic. She draws upon J.L. Austin's concept of performative utterances or speech acts. Instances in which speech does not merely describe reality, but changes it. For example, saying I do in a wedding or pronouncing two people man and wife. According to Butler, when medical professionals pronounce us to be either a boy or a girl, they are such a speech act, manifesting a new reality. However, the individual is always defining their gender for the process of repeated speech. The word queer, 
once used as a slur, has now been co-opted by the LGBT community and transformed into a badge of honour, undergoing a mimetic transformation, as the meme is imperfectly copied ad infinitum. However, there are clearly semantic constraints placed upon such language. Should the word queer come to encompass both the LGBT community and also white nationalist skinheads, paleo-conservatives, then we would rightly question what such language means. In order for a speech act to change the world, it needs to describe the quality of the change. When a judge says, I find the suspect guilty, not only do they change reality, but they describe the quality of the change through the semantic content of their performative utterance. The judge does not come to define what the word guilt means, and certainly not the suspect, though they may like to. Instead, the judge leans on established legal conventions and laws to reach their verdict. The slamming of a judge's gavel and the suspect's tears are testament enough to the shared semantic content of the judge's utterance. What would such scenarios look like if guilt was emptied of its semantic content? What if standing at the altar and uttering I do also meant I don't and also something in between? These examples illustrate what happens when a referent no longer refers to any particular concept, leading to the main thesis of this work. The first premise is as follows. Gender roles and ideals are passed on to individuals for the agents of socialisation. Premise number two. Gender can be understood as the performance of certain behaviours and movements normalised by the society we live in. Number three. To be any given gender is therefore defined by those in control of the agents of socialisation. Number four. Gender is shaped by the power relations between individuals and agents of socialisation. Number five, once individuals have the power to define their own gender, there are no limits to what any given gender can be. Number six, there is nothing necessary and sufficient to be any given gender. Any behaviour can be seen as an expression of one's gender. Number seven, gender refers to no specific thing or way of being. Number eight, a referent that refers to no particular thing is not a referent. A symbol that symbolises no particular thing is not a symbol. And finally, the conclusion, gender refers to no particular thing, therefore there are no genders. If the word gender is a referent that refers to no particular thing, and if its etymological root, the Latin word genus, no longer refers to any particular kind or classification of beings, then this raises a question as to whether self-ID, self-identification, leads to the abolition of gender as an intersubjectively shared referent. If an individual stands up and makes it known that they identify as X, what change is it that they have brought into the world other than uttering such a statement? J.O. Austin breaks down speech acts into their constituent parts. The term locution refers to the spoken speech act itself, such as the phrase, I do. Elocution conveys the speaker's intent and the result of the act to declare their marriage to their partner in such a phrase such as I do. And perlocution refers to the effect of the speech act to agree, persuade, convince, enlighten, disagree. When an individual utters that they are a woman, what is the locutionary force, the meaning of this statement? I am X, a constellation of all of my gender performances? Bearing in mind that no, that no specific performances are required to be X, indeed, such performances could just as easily be Y or Z. Similarly, what is the perlocutionary force? The effect of the speech act, is it to describe? Well, to describe what? Is it to convince us? To convince us about what specific change? There has to be an intelligible difference between the genders in order for there to be multiple genders. 
a gender as a referent, a sign or a symbol must refer to or signify or symbolize and describe these unique qualities of any given gender. Indeed, we have a suspect with no characteristics to sketch. How do we spot X or any given gender in the world or even in ourselves? A clear example of such confusion can be seen in the LGBTQ policy journal's recommendations, which proposes that society should come to treat gender identities in the same way as we currently do blood types. No doubt, recording an individual's blood type is a necessary and indeed potentially life-saving source of information. However, we don't come to ascribe specific norms or roles to people that are O negative. We don't think O positives should stay at home and look after the kids, while B negatives climb the corporate ladder. Maybe such a future would be preferable. However, this analogy is nonsense. We are able to identify specific blood types as they refer to unique physical and anatomical structures. Gender, according to Judith Butler and other gender theorists, does not. We cannot empirically identify gender in the world like we can analyse a vial of blood. If the blood type O negative referred to no thing in particular, and what constituted type O could just as easily constitute B positive, then we would have no taxonomy of blood types. Only a bundle of reference that do not refer. Labels without their glue. Clearly, shared language cannot be defined individually without creating reference that do not refer. As the word woman and man now float freely in the ether, like a helium balloon cut from its moorings. Instead, language is defined intersubjectively, as it is used in groups, communities and society at large. As Ludwig Wittgenstein remarked, the meaning of a word comes from its use, as Judith Butler well knows. A pragmatic understanding of the words gender, man and woman, where such meaning is derived from how they are used, would solve the problem of reference that do not refer. However, this would then lead to an equally grave concern about the idea of our gender being something we can self-identify. In other words, if gender is seen as the result of the tension between socially prescribed gender roles and the individual's gender performances, then Butler is walking a tightrope. If she leans too much towards performativity to define gender, then there is nothing to ground the meaning of such language. However, too far the other way, and the same old social roles constrain theories of self-identification. Gender as a symbol, which symbolises no particular thing, would lead to the abolition of gender, which may or may not be preferable as an outcome. But Judith Butler's theory of performativity does not effectively carve out a logical space to capture the unique and complex characteristics of different gender identities and how these identities relate to sexually diamorphic bodies. Instead, we must see the bi-directional interplay between gender and sex, as sex bodies are seen through the lens of gender, and as gender is underpinned by sexually dimorphic bodies, and comes to amplify the socially constructed meaning of such sexual differences. In other words, we may see the social construct of gender as an amplifier of our biological characteristics and of the differences between sexually diamorphic bodies. As the construct of gender reinforces certain notions of biology and of what constitutes men and women that are then turned into sexual selection that then leads to increased differences between the male and female body and the male and female experience. If you've liked this video, please consider dropping a like and subscribing to the channel. Thank you.